Right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So my name is Chris Morrison. And my name is Jane Secker. Uh, and we are the co-chairs of the Copyright and Online Learning Special Interest Group, a special interest group of ALT, the Association for Learning Technology. Yes, and you're joining us for our 63rd webinar, where we're going to be talking about the very hot topic of copyright and hot, artificial intelligence. Hot, hot topic. We yeah. do indeed have a, uh, an expert special guest with us today. Um, so let us have a look at the running order, if you can get there. <laughs> You're controlling the mouse this morning. I'm doing well. Okay. I'm doing well. Yeah. I'm all over it. Yeah. Um, so we don't have that many items of news. We don't. We haven't actually done a webinar though for the summer, so yeah. we're back from our summer break. Mm -hmm. Although some of us have still got their holiday to come. Absolutely. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, but Those of us don't have to worry about school holidays, <laughs> take your holiday in September. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, but we're going to just do a bit of copyright news and uh, then we're really delighted. We've got Alex Fenlon from uh, University of Birmingham joining us to talk about copyright and AI. Um, and uh, then we'll tell you a bit about what we've got coming up next yep. after that. But we're hoping to have lots of time for discussion about this topic. We know it's come up on this copy seek. And so I'm sure that lots of you are, um, are ready and waiting with all sorts of questions to ask um, Alex. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. So what have we been up to since we last met, Chris? What's going on here? Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, this was, I mean, as, as you know, Jane and I are consummate musicians. Professional Indeed. musicians, really. Uh, yeah. But what we were doing here, you, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what we were doing here is we were at the Playful Learning Conference in Leicester. This was at the beginning of July, um, and we thought we would do a songwriting workshop. So this was us demonstrating one of our copyright jingles um, and how we came up with it. But then we we asked other people to come up with the conference theme tune, either the conference theme tune or a song about their own practice area of expertise. And it was fantastic. It was brilliant, wasn't it? We had three yeah. teams. They actually all came up with the um, conference theme tune yeah. idea. Um, and there is there is a podcast. There the, is. The Pedagogzilla podcast. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. I will go and find that link and I will put it in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, our friends who run a podcast called Pedagogzilla, which is all about uh, teaching and learning with a kind of pop culture twist. Um, I think it's a pop culture core, they say. Pop culture core. Could be a core um, and twist. Yeah, so they, they recorded um, live the performances from the, the four bands, I think there were, that were put together. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's some great anecdotes from the Playful Learning Conference. So it's, yeah, it's a big um, inspiration for us. So we have been out on the road a bit since we last met, mm. haven't we? Yeah. So yeah. I've got the link here, so. Excellent. Good stuff. Are you going to pop that in the chat? Yeah. Thank you. There we go. Right. So uh, this is just a quick reminder to everybody um, about the webinar and um, archive of all the previous sessions that we've done. So you can find those on, on our website on copyright literacy, but you can also um, subscribe to the YouTube channel that comes from the Association for Learning Technology. They have a playlist that's got all our recorded webinars. This is where the recording from today's session will end up as well. Um, so just a quick reminder, many regulars will know this. Okay, Chris, play that theme tune. The seamless, seamless, buffering, buffering, <laughs> loading, loading. Um, we could just sing it. Just get copyright news, copyright, copyright news, copyright, copyright news, copyright yeah. news, copyright. Anyway, copyright news, here's uh, a small selection of news items. Yeah, that's okay. good. Take it away. So first item. So yeah, we mentioned um, uh, that Greg was very integral in helping us run the Icebox conference, um, which we ran um, in twentieth of July. Wow, it was. Yeah, yeah. It seems a long time ago, but it yeah. was a fantastic event. Yeah, uh, at the University of Glasgow. There is now um, all the presentations available. So if you weren't able to join us. 
Um, you can have a look on the website. We've got our keynotes and um, we've got their slides. This is Chris and I with um, Amy Thomas, who was one of our keynotes talking about copyright and video games. Um, and um, we've also we've got a couple of really quite amusing photos coming up there. We we treated people on on both days, didn't we? To some of our incredible performances. Mm. First day, we did some country dancing. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. But it was backed by an amazing salon orchestra in, uh, from Glasgow University, including the director of Create, the research centre, Martin Kretschmer, who um, they were just fantastic. They um, are professional musicians. They, they were they were a great band, and yeah. there was a copyright theme to all the music that they played. Yeah. And then there's look, you know, dressed as Mario and Luigi. Yes. Which, which was good. Fun. Which was another highlight of the conference, and that's us on the closing panel with uh, Professor Nick Whitten, who was our other keynote. He talked about playing for learning. Um, and yeah, we had a really great interactive session with her. Yeah. But thank you to everybody who presented at Ice Pops. We've got lots of resources up from everybody who did lightning talks. We've got resources from people who are part of the World Cafe. And um, if um, if there's anything that anybody wanted to share, any of the speakers at Ice Pops who haven't yet sent anything to us, just let me know yeah. and I can continue to update that website. And to say thank you for everyone who provided feedback as well. So, yes. you know, we, we got some really great feedback. So people still seem to like it, which is yeah. which is nice. Yeah. Um, I think the next item, I think Elizabeth, thank you very much in the chat. I see that you've mentioned what we're about to talk about next. Um, shall we go to the next slide? Oh, yeah. I've gone too far. There we oh. go. So yes, the reason we were in Coventry is because we were at the old conference where, what do you want to explain what it was that we were there for? Yes, so um, we, well, we attended the 30th anniversary gala dinner of the Association for Learning Technology. Um, we did know that we had been highly commended mm -hmm. for leadership in digital education, um, and we didn't we didn't win the award, but the judges felt that the work that we've been doing, running these webinars and chairing and setting up the copyright and online learning special interest group was worthy of commendation. Yeah. And so this is us with our certificates. I've actually got my certificate here. Um, I can wave it when we're on camera properly. Um, but yeah, we, we, we're we really delighted. There's further information on the old website about all the award winners. Um, and I'm really proud of the fact that City University, my university, did clear up quite a number of the awards. Yeah. So the winner of the Digital Leadership Award was our Deputy Director in my department, uh, Julie Vose, and the Digital Education Team of the Year was also City University Digital, yeah. Digital Education. So yeah, but it was it was really great to be celebrated, and yeah. we got to we got to go and talk about copyright again. We did, and uh, to thank you to all of you that that keep tuning in and that have contributed, of course, because um, we're the hosts. But it's you guys coming and talking about your areas of expertise and practice that makes this actually work. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, no, thank you everybody. Yeah, so... Um, um, there's one more item of news, isn't there? There is, yeah, yeah. So uh, I spotted this actually just mm. yesterday, I think, this came out. So um, our, our friends at Create, um, who are always producing these fantastic working papers, have got um, one on generative AI. So I thought that one was really relevant to the topic of today's webinar. Um, priorities for generative AI regulation in the UK. Chris has just popped the link in um, for the chat, and as I say, that one's literally hot off the press. Came out yesterday, um, and it's going to be well worth a read. So, but yeah, I think that's it for all the news. I think so. So we are now delighted to introduce our guest speaker today, Alex Fenland from the University of Birmingham. Um, Alex is the head of copyright and licensing there. Um, has been working in the field within our community for many years. Um, and as we know, there's been lots of conversations everywhere at the moment about artificial intelligence and particularly mm. generative artificial intelligence. Um, and Alex was kind enough to come on to the, share with this Coffee Seek his blog post that he wrote about considerations for researchers at Birmingham. Um, and so we said, we jumped on it. We jumped on it immediately. <laughs> Alex, please come. Can we talk to you about it? Um, and, and today I think it's going to be a really good opportunity uh, to sort um, some of the 
a sort of red herring bit from the things that really the things that really we need to know about in our practice as copyright advisors. So, Alex, um, really great to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm we sure. just double check we can hear you, can't we? I think we did check this before we came on, but should work. I haven't touched anything. Fabulous. There Hello. You are. Yeah, so I'm great. just going to get your slides up. Um, Thank you very much. There we go. And so, Alex, over to you. The floor is yours. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And, and thank you very much, Chris and Jane, for inviting me to come and speak to you, uh, to everybody today. Um, it's been a while since I've been at, at one of these. Um, uh, and it's good to be here, good to be back, and, and uh, a good morning to everybody. Um, so, I'm going to crack straight on um, and, and and get really into the to the nuts and bolts of the conversation that we want to go through this morning. Um, I'll run through some slides, but hopefully, as Chris and Jane said, there should be some opportunity to have some discussion at the end, because I think really the 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 interesting stuff will come out from that conversation. Um, hopefully, um, I did I didn't really have a chance to look at the create report that was just mentioned just then, but hopefully it aligns with um, what we're going to cover in in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, but yeah, I would probably recommend reading that one to to, to just update um, a knowledge and information to make sure that it's uh, we're we're moving in the same path. Um, so we'll talk briefly about the context um, that we're operating in at the moment and an activity that's taking place um, across the sector currently. We'll, we'll pause and just spend um, a minute or two talking about the activity that we've been doing at Birmingham. And then we'll really get into the considerations that copyright advisors, people who are the copyright gurus, copyright experts um, for institutions need to, to look at and to be aware of. And then, heaven forbid, we might even talk about some non-copyright related issues, which are uh, equally important. Um, I've added a, a couple of bullet points there at the bottom of the slide to say that um, biases is a really important thing to talk about and, and to be aware of, but we simply didn't. didn't time to, to cover it in any great detail in these slides today. Um, neither will we talk about the carbon uh, footprints and the impact of um, uh, you know vast amounts of computer programming uh, and the socioeconomic impact of um, uh, AI tools being trained using labor from the global south. That's a really important issue that's, that's not covered in this conversation that needs discussing as well, I think. And then the knotty issue of hallucinations. I think we might touch on that slightly, but um, yeah, something to be aware of that, that sometimes the references that these AI tools generate are not necessarily always accurate, truthful um, at all. Okay, so um, we'll start off by talking about the policy landscape. Uh, and we, uh, colleagues, will be aware, no doubt, that the UK government has uh, this ambition to be a global leader in AI. Um, and to make sure that that we are a global superpower when it comes to AI knowledge infrastructure and um, uh, creativity research um, and those sorts of things. So the government has been very hot on AI, investing significant sums into developing centres and resource and expertise, really trying to push the way in that particular field. Um, we also have various sector bodies trying to, to engage in the AI space as well, trying to support their respective communities, making sure that they um, are aware, are up to speed and uh, utilising the, the, the benefits of the AI can generate for, for their particular communities. Uh, for our sector, you know, JISC are very active in this space, RL UK um, and the Russell Group. Um, with their recent release uh, on their principles for education that we'll, that we'll talk about. Um, in terms of the legislation, um, it seems like we've been in perpetual consultation for the last three or four years um, with the IPO looking at uh, legislative solutions um, for, for, for the AI conundrum, uh, and we'll talk about that um, in, in a minute too. But really, on the ground, what we're seeing probably since the start of 2023, probably post Easter, I think, we've really seen an increase in institutional awareness of generative AI tools, um, especially in relation to learning and teaching, in, and especially in, in relation to the use of those tools by students. Um, I think there's a real concern within institutions that, that students are going to be using some of these tools to generate their assignments and submit their work. 
we do know that, that lots of our academics, our, our lecturing staff, um, are engaged in trialing and testing and experimenting with some of these the, these new tools that are available. Um, you know, running their 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 questions, their their assignments through them, uh, and seeing what answers are generated. You know, asking them to generate lesson plans um, and uh, assessment criteria and things like that. So we know that there's lots of activity taking place, certainly at our place uh, at Birmingham, and I'm sure that's that's the same up and down the country. Um, we have a new uh, GAI channel that focuses on, on teaching and learning that was created in May, I think, and that's got over 200, around 200 members at the moment. And it's a fairly active community talking about all these different tools and um, models and methods that they're experimenting with. Um, and we can see, um, I mentioned just a minute ago, the, the Russell Group guidance. Um, that's really been the trigger, I think, over the last couple of months um, at the early part of the summer. For for institutions to update their, their their plagiarism policies, their their guidance for for students and for lecturers, um, to try and deal with this threat or perceived threat at least of, of generative AI and the impact that it's going to have on, on learning and teaching. Um, and the, the National AI Centre, um, JISC's National AI Centre, updated one of their policy guidance a, a couple of days ago, um, and really to say that this this focus on GAI is leading to a reevaluation re of assessment practices, and, and that's probably a good thing. I think possibly long overdue. And really, coming back to the the, the copyright aspect of it, the, the 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 legal aspect of it, I think it's fair to say that that progress is slow uh, certainly in the uk um we've seen a shift from the uk ipo moving away uk government moving away from a, a broad tdm exception that was um announced 18 months ago 12 months ago um, that's been completely uh, rolled back from and we're now looking at the codes of practice voluntary codes of practice codes of conduct rather than a legislative solution in the uk at least um, the eu have their the ai act uh, which is currently uh, going through trialogue at the moment. So it's going to be interesting to see how that uh, turns out when the consultations and the discussions um, finally reach their conclusions, but that might be some time away. Uh, we also know that there are numerous uh, copyright and privacy related lawsuits that are ongoing in the UK, US and EU, and it's going to be uh, really important for us to keep an eye on those to see um, what the outcomes of they are. Of, of those are um, because they will have some real impacts and, uh, and, and maybe to some of those questions that we'll come on to in a minute. I think it's fair to say, uh, noting the irony, of course, um, that there is a lot of noise and a lot of hype around the benefits and the problems of AI at the moment. There are lots of uh, uh, lots of online seminars, webinars, there are lots of articles, thought pieces, comments and blogs talking about it. It's a very hot topic, as we said at the moment, um, and it's it's really hard to stay on top of um, that news piece, uh, to stay on top of um, what we should be listening to and, and trying to get our information sources from. So I think, you know, events like this, um, forums like list copy seek are really important for us to be able to to share and post information articles um, reports things like that so we as a community community can can try and stay up to speed with what's going on and how it impacts on our on our sector and the advice that we provide so just going to pause for a second and talk about what we've been doing at birmingham um, really, really briefly. So, you know, we've been aware of the TDM exception in UK law since it was introduced in 2014, and we've really been working with our academic community to try and make sure that they're able to leverage and utilise the benefits from that exception within their research activity. So we've been supporting them with, with various queries over the years, building web pages, attending events and talking to them about it for a good long time. And really, that activity has very much been focused on, on them using you know, library data, third parties, alternatively source data uh, within their research activity, within their non-commercial research activity. We haven't really been involved in, in helping them or, or even thinking about building data sets that might be publicly available, build, building tools that might be public, publicly available um, in any way that is similar to the, the types of tools that people are talking about and using these days is really being non-commercial research focused rather than anything that, that that we've dealt with over the last six 12 months or so 
Uh, we've been get, been engaged in a couple of projects ourselves. So a Times Digital Archive data mining project um, started in 2018, looking at how we support our research and researchers and provide access to data sets that we have um, procured for TDM purposes. And then we had a digitized to mine project that we've been running this year, which looked at um, how our digitization service can digitize materials specifically for the purposes of, of TDM, AI, NLP, you know, big data type research methods uh, and what changes and processes are needed to be able to support that. Really, all of this journey has been about us trying to equip ourselves with the skills and expertise, knowledge to be able to critically analyze and assess AI tools and really to, to build a try and to try to do let me put my teeth in to try to build a joined up service to support digital research, digital scholarship, and that includes AI, TDM, NLP, those types of things. Um, in recent months, we've been working with our, our Higher Education's Future Institute, HEFI, um, as, as they've been the ones leading on the guidance for, for GAI in, in, in the teaching and learning space. We've been working with our academic skills team and with our research skills team to try and uh, update and tailor the support that they provide to their particular cohorts. And that's been really interesting for the last few months. And then I've got a gratuitous shot of our of Dubai campus um, that's going to give me time to have a quick sip. And then we'll move on to talk about the issues that we're going to explore today. So what we've seen over the last few months in working with our academic colleagues, with our lecturing staff, is very much that the focus is on how these tools can be used. How can they be uh, used to benefit their, their teaching practice? How can they be used to supplement um, their assignments, their assessment uh, techniques? How might the students use them to, um, to, to write and to generate um, assignments and, and the issues that are associated with that? Um, Every time one of these uh, issues comes up on the Teams channel, I jump in with a copyright and licensing concern. And one of my colleagues, you know, mentioned to me the other day that there is a very real risk that that some of these key questions that we think are absolutely essential, um, that horse may have already bolted. But um, I'm going to run into the field and try and wrangle it and get it back into the stable and and have those conversations again. I think luckily for us within this community. I think some of the issues that we're going to tackle um, are not necessarily um, that new or unique uh, to AI. I think it's not a case of the emperor's new clothes. I think we do have a level of familiarity uh, with some of the core issues that are concerned here, but the lens might change slightly, the focus might change slightly. I think there is still that need that, that, that colleagues in this community and elsewhere have been pushing for uh, those basic basic copyright related literacies and I think that AI literacy this new term that's being being uh, talked about it will become in the fullness of time a core element of digital and information literacy and I think for us as, as copyright advisors and the copyright uh, community we really need to look at those core issues that we've been dealing with in in most of our queries so looking at the permissions the ownerships the, the authorship uh, and the 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 how exceptions and, and licenses and limitations might impact on on uses of of material uh, with AI tools generated by AI tools as well. So we'll spend the next few minutes talking about the six topics on, on the slide, um, and we'll go into the first one, which is training data. So this is the the the, the act of harvesting or scraping. Uh, data various different sources that's then used to test and train the algorithms that sit behind the generative AI tools and there's a real question that we face at the moment um, around the sources of that data they, they the tools are commonly used you know in vogue at the moment some of them are started off being quite open with where they source their data from and then we've seen over the last few months that that has been shrouded in mystery there's been some ambiguity there's a certain a level of um a, a lack of transparency that's that's involved in those data sources some people say that they're they're kind of black box tools hence the flight recorder on the screen um that we don't really know where their data sources um are coming from and because of that we don't really know if 
the the data sources that have been used to train these algorithms to train these tools it, it, it is legal if they if they come from legal access if they're based on licenses if they're based on on exceptions we don't really know um, the mechanisms by which the the data has been harvested and that lack of transparency causes a concern because there's a risk then that if the data is has been harvested illegally that um, the, the the sources could be um, problematic and, and and troublesome for us to use and support. I think what we'll see from the lawsuits that are, that are ongoing across the various jurisdictions over the coming months, he says, hopefully uh, years, um, is really a, a deeper understanding of, of what these tools do with the data when they go and harvest and scrape it, whether there is a a wholesale copying, you know, whether they retain that data, they repurpose it and resurface it within the outputs, or whether what they're doing is more transient and more incidental, um, whether they go and read something, analyze, take the statistical analysis out of it, and then then they're done with a particular data source. And I think that's going to be one of the key issues that will come out from the conversations and, and the lawsuits over the over the coming weeks, <coughs> months. So then we move on to, to input data. So once the, the, the model has been trained and has been developed and, and released, um, the users are then able to go in and add inputs and add prompts into the, the services. And of course, before you before you get access to the tool, you have to sign up to uh, to access it. You have to agree to the terms and conditions. You effectively have to agree, uh, have to agree to a license. Uh, and uh, again, that will be more than familiar to, to colleagues um, on call um, and I'm sure we will know that that people don't read them and even if they do read them the chances of them understanding the nuances and what their means and the obligations are extremely thin um, and that causes a problem um, because there are lots of terms and conditions within those agreements that that, that we need to be aware of that we need to be cognizant of I, I pulled out just two of the key issues for this particular audience on a slide really uh, and that is to say that when a user signs up they will invariably sign up to say that they own the inputs that they provide so that any 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 uh questions any text that they put in any images that they put in they sign to say that they own that material um and that's fine on an individual user personal basis, that's no problem. But as an employee, as an institution, there's question marks about who actually owns that material. If I, I know from my personal circumstances, I don't own the material that I produce as part of my employment with the university. So then can I really legally sign to say that? And that's a question that, that doesn't seem to be answered or addressed in the guidance or the conversations that we're seeing at, at the moment. Following on from the ownership question, invariably the user will grant a license to the platform, to the tool, for it to then use that content for its purposes, for the purposes of, of providing the responses, but also possibly for the, for the purposes of, of training and developing the algorithm, the tool, further. And again, that's a license that, that the user is granting to the, the, the tool, to the platform. And if we as individuals don't own that material then we don't have the authority to be able to grant that license so then who should be signing those terms and conditions should it be individuals in their personal capacity or should it be the institutions that are signing them enabling that use to take place and this is a conversation that that we should be really familiar with in in other aspects of, of what we do as well so that's nothing new for us we know that uh, some of these tools have uh, opt outs. So in theory, you can select to say that um, I don't want my training data to be to be retained. And it's going to be interesting to see how effective that actually is and whether um, uh, whether that is the case or not. But it's a challenging one, but something I don't think we're, we're unfamiliar with necessarily within this particular audience. Now. I put exceptions as, as number three on the list, um, and I'm sure colleagues are absolutely familiar with the TDM exception in uh, Section 29A, the Copyright Designs and Patents Act, uh, and I'm sure we will we will be familiar with what it says about um, this being limited in scope to to non-commercial research activities, 
um, using computational analysis uh, on content that we have legal access to. We will be aware that, that there is a no contract override in that clause as well that talks about if there are licensed terms that, that prevent us from, from doing TDM, we can uh, use the exception to override them and engage in, in, in that sort of activity. But we also know that most GAI tools are not non-commercial in nature. And that immediately poses a problem that they could be infringing under, under UK law if depending on what they do, it is viewed to be to take a to take a copy and therefore to be an infringement. And, and I know there is an alternative school of thought of that um, around whether whether there is any copying, whether it's transient or incidental, um, as I mentioned earlier on. If we look at the uh, copyright in the digital single market um, regulations in the EU, we know that Article 3 and Article 4 cover scientific research for by certain uh, heritage and educational research institutes in article three and then um, commercial uses by everybody else under article four um, article four contains an, an opt-out which says that if a rights holder does not want their, their content to be mined then they can um, uh, opt out of that particular provision um, uh, accordingly what we know I mean, the TDM exception in the UK has been around since 2014, and we know that there are some problems with it. We know that the technical protection measures are still a barrier, and we know that um, trying to get rights holders to, to, to give us access is, is challenging in certain situations. We know that there are problems with data sharing, you know, the ability to um, provide a, a mined data set for, for, for data mining purposes, a harvested data set with collaborators either across institutional boundaries or indeed in, across international borders is particularly challenging. Uh, and of course, we know that, that neither of the exceptions EU and, and uh, EU law refer to anything around sublicing, sub, sublicensing, the ability to, to grant permission to third parties over and above uh, what it says in the exception. So we know that that's a particular challenge. And then when it comes to users, um, we will be acutely aware of you know non-commercial research private study exceptions as well as the illustration for instruction exception again i think that's probably fine using these tools is probably fine within those particular remits apart from the downstream licensing part again none of those set none of those exceptions to my mind grant the permission that the platforms seek when you upload third-party content if it's your content that's fine. If it's not, then there's a potential risk to be aware of too. And then we come on to, to outputs. And this is a really interesting question around whether or not the, the outputs are generated by these GAI tools, these AI tools, whether they are copyright works in the sense of, of the legislative um, perspective, whether they are original or creative enough and, and how that creativity process, that originality of thought, how that interacts with the technical ability, the technical capacity, capability for the program to generate something. We'll be familiar with concepts like the spread of the, the sweat of the brow of the author, you know, the author's intellectual, independent intellectual creations. These are you know, central tenets to what originality and copyright are. And that's potentially a problem when it comes to AI because there is no human author there. Uh, and we'll come on to, to what the law says in a second. Um, and then if they are copyright works, then what are they made of? Are they pure whole reproductions of original content, of original copyright works? Are they reproductions of substantial parts? If they are, then there's a chance that they're infringements. Are they derivative works? Are they adaptations? We know that um, certain sections of the sector are using these tools for translation. We know as copyright experts that translation, adaptation are rights reserved by the, or the owners, the, the, the rights holders. And that's gonna be a problem that we need to deal with. And then we look at what, what the case is, what the situation is with the UK versus international legislation uh, and whether the use of, by these tools could be viewed as transformative in the US. And we've got Richard Prince and, and his use of um, 
his arguments around transformative reuse, uh, noting that he's uh, fairly recently lost one of his cases around the uh, the Instagram posts, um, which is so that's going to be interesting to see because we could see a whole sweet and raft of arguments in the in the cases that talk about transformative reuse in the US and then of course how that impacts if it does on, on the UK perspective. So I mentioned we talk about UK law as well. Um, and if we assume that the works generated by AI tools are copyright works, then in the UK we have the provisions in section nine that talk about the ownership of those works as well, um, so that the author will be the person by whom the arrangements necessary for the creation of the work are undertaken. We know that the legislation um, grants a 50 year duration for those, for those computer generated works as well, and we know that they are, um, they are works that are where there is no human author. But we also know that the UK is somewhat out of step with the rest of the world. We know that, again, the US in particular take a view that, that because there is no human author, AI tools, um, AI outputs might not necessarily have uh, an owner, which then might place them in the public domain, which is going to be an interesting challenge. So how that plays out over the next few months is going to be really interesting for us to keep an eye on. And then I was taking the dog for a walk. Uh, and all of a sudden I thought, it's been a long time since I've done a copyright specific training session. And every time I used to do one a few years ago, pre COVID, I had to include the copyright monkey and had to include the selfie monkey. And really, um, if there is no owner of the, if there is no copyright in those works, then I can see a situation where we're going to be talking about the copyright monkey again. Um, this question about ownership um, and human authors and, it, and there are parallels there with AI authors. But I think if there is copyright in it and, and we start untangling what the legislation means about, um, you know, who made the necessary arrangements for the creation, is that going to be the, the user, the person sat there putting the prompts in? And we know that there's this whole field emerging at the moment called prompt engineering, where, where the quality of the input uh, impact on the quality of the output. And how you use the, and deploy the tool will, 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 will significantly impact on the quality of those outputs. So if you're putting significant effort and thought and sweat, labor and judgment into the inputs to use the tool, does that, is that sufficient for you to get own authorship, ownership of the rights that, of the outputs that come out? It's going to be a really interesting question. Or is it actually the AI tool itself? Or is it the company that, that produced it, the individual um, organizations that produce those tools as well? And it's really going to be a really interesting um, time for when those conversations, when those arguments come to fruition. Yeah. And, and you know, can monkeys own copyright? Can AI own copyright? It's a really interesting, knotty conversation. And, and, you know, it's a really nice picture, so always like to include that one. Um, the last one of, of my six points I wanted to talk about in, in terms of a copyright specific queries for us to be aware of is this balance between uh, an interplay between infringement and plagiarism. You know, if we talk about copyright infringement being the use of somebody's words, for example, without permission and without um, coverage under an exception, you can use other words, you can rephrase, you can paraphrase, and you might not infringe the expression um, that's protected by a copyright. For plagiarism, however, it's slightly more, slightly different. Um, if you copy the idea without the attribution, then there is a risk that you're going to be guilty of, a, of an academic plagiarism infringement. So even if you use those different words, then it's going to be potentially problematic. And this is where the, the idea and expression dichotomy comes in that that colleagues will no doubt be familiar with. And to what extent are the ideas separated, or separatable from the text that's actually used within the expression itself? And it's going to be really difficult um, to, to, to disentangle some of that stuff in, in certain situations. And especially uh, that's going to be the case where GAI tools do not reference where they're sourcing material from. Uh, and we know that, that lots of the, the most popular tools simply don't reference where they're sourcing their information from. 
Um, and the lack of referencing is going to be really problematic for our students. How do they know who they need to cite and acknowledge when the sort of information isn't um, attributed at all? And indeed, talking about hallucinations briefly, um, uh, hallu uh, references that, that simply do not exist. And I'm sure our front desks and inquiry colleagues are going to be inundated by queries over the coming months when, when students come back. OK, and I've got another gratuitous shot of campus just for me to take a drink and then we shift focus to some of those non copyright specific concerns. <clears throat> OK, so one of the big ones that I wanted to talk about first and foremost is the, the really uh, knotty and tricky issue of privacy and personal data. We know that some of the big tools have been subject to various complaints um, about how they process personal data. You know, Italy have launched complaints uh, and banned ChatGPT uh, recently, although it was restored. Um, we know that um, Austria had issues with uh, facial rec recognition and biometrics data. Uh, and we know that uh, Ireland and, and the European Commission are, are taking increasing uh, interest in some of the privacy policies and some of the way that some of these tools uh, handle um, personal data. They're really looking at uh, under what legal basis are, are these tools processing that personal data? How is it collected, retained? Um, and that's going to be a really interesting conversation. You know, if you look at it from a personal perspective, if you're uploading, you know, information, uh, personal details on one site, um, you might not, not necessarily expect it to then be harvested and reused and repurposed under a completely different um, website format tool um with without your knowledge and that's uh, that's a real concern for individual for us as individuals but also within our co uh, professional capacity as well um and what i'm seeing on the ground certainly within our institution is um when you ask about data protection and you ask whether whether your know, data data protection uh, impacts assessments are being completed they're not necessarily following those things through uh, the same process is that we might rely on in our ethical clearance um, might not necessarily be being transferred over to um, our teaching concerns as well and that might be um, might be considered problematic and then there's the issues around referencing and how do you reference uh, the GAI tools within within your 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 delivery within your assessments within your assignments as well which could be potentially challenging Alex Alex, can I just come and let you know you've, we've got yes. three minutes left in the session, so I think we want to leave time for right. the discussion at the end, just to kind of okay. make sure where we are. Uh, you carry on. Fine, I'll rattle. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, I'll rattle through these if I if I can. Um, responsibility, uh, reproducibility, and consistency is an interesting problem. Um, there's been um, certainly uh, in the early days of these tools being launched, and it might be. Um, less of an issue these days, um, but res results would vary by, you know, day by day, almost hour by hour. Um, so you can put in identical prompts and get completely different responses. And that's a real challenge in terms of the research space because that, that reproducibility, being able to check and validate, to test and repeat results is a real crucial part of, of, of the research process. And if we apply that to the teaching space, and that's going to be increasingly challenging because ultimately it could impact on a student's results. It could impact on a student's grades, and that's going to be a real challenge. And there is a real risk that if these tools don't provide stable results, stable consistent results, then this reproducibility crisis that we're facing in the research space could well extend into the teaching space too. And that's something for us to be aware of and to, to, to raise concerns with. Um, sustainability and equity is also another one. Um, lots of these tools are currently uh, open, um, but we are seeing, um, you know, freemium models, um, full premium subscription models coming on board where you can get access to the latest version, latest tools for, you know, the princely sum of, of $20 a month or whatever it is, um, whereas the free version offers an outdated version with, with limited capacity capability. So those that can afford to, to pay the subscriptions, then, then they will get a better experience, better, better um, uh, insight than, than those that cannot. And that's going to be a problem. 
and in a world where there are no institutional models, uh, institutional subscriptions at the moment, requiring our students to pay and access these tools could cause problems with the CMA, could cause problems with the OFS as well. And also, you know, these tools are uh, subject to huge investment from, from Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley moves very quickly. What might be in vogue today might be um, old hat tomorrow. And there's a chance that the tools that we, we are using today could disappear from, from public view completely. They could be hidden and incorporated into other products, as we're seeing um, with, with some uh, of these tools already. Or they could simply be dumped and, and, and no longer uh, uh, supported in any way, shape or form. So that's a real issue for us to be aware of. Uh, I'm going to whistle through these next two. So pre-publication submissions, if you run your, your article, your grant submission through one of these tools and, uh, you know, for a grammar check or for, for a precy, a concise version of it, something like that, then, then because of the license that you grant to them, there's a risk that that, that knowledge, that information that you communicate could then be resurfaced to others um, without attribution and could um, prevent you from securing that grant or securing that publication agreement. Um, and that could be a real problem. And if we look at um, research within a research context, we know that um, if you're trying to patent um, something, uh, non-confidential disclosures is a real problem. Putting information into the public domain is a real problem for for patenting and could lead to a patent being rejected on the grounds that the information is already within the, the state of the art, within the, the, the common knowledge. And similarly, if we look at um, commercialization of research, there's a big push for research funders to, to translate research from, from the bench to the bedside and back again, as they say. Um, lots of research in, in non-commercial research in UK uh, into AI and the question mark about when when do these tools that might be being developed, when do they shift from, from being non-commercial research into commercialization and translation activity and what happens with all of that training data and all of that harvesting work that's been going on in, in the back end. So a summary, um, I think it's really import, important to, to read up on some of those issues around those biases, the social and economic climate factors. Um, uh, that, that can be um, uh, uh, key and essential to understanding how GAI tools, and they remain to be explored, and I would, would advise colleagues to go and explore some of the, the conversation there on those. There is lots of noise around AI, there is lots of hype at the moment, um, but I think our core knowledge that we have and that we exploit on a daily basis is really essential. Um, it's going to be really important to keep an eye on the code of practice, the IPO, generating um, the, the AI Act that's going through the EU at the moment that's going to be really important to keep an eye on, as is the, those cases that are going through. And breathe. I think that's me. Well done, Alex. Uh, Alex, thank you so much. Yeah, um, uh, we're going to share your slides afterwards. Thank you so much. Um, we were just having a bit of a chat here and saying, there's a lot we could be talking about, I think, and we're wondering whether, and we're wondering whether next month we do a more sort of discursive session as well about copyright and AI and continue this. Um, but we, yeah, I we, think so. We've got some time now. I think we can start people with some questions off, and yeah. then perhaps dedicate next month's whole hour to discussions yeah. about this because. I mean, you, you, I you're think scratching the, the sort of, you know, the surface in many ways. Of, yeah, you see. I think that's it. I, I, I think that is very much a, a whistle stop overview of some of the issues, and there's lots of nuance in each of those six issues that I mentioned. Mm. And there's probably, you know, another. 15, 20 issues that we could talk about as well. Yeah. So so ex having the time and space to be able to explore those would be really, really interesting and really, really valuable, I think. So yeah, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll do that. We'll, we'll advertise that um, for, uh, in early October, I think. Um, yeah, that's, that's, and I, I mean, I thought what would be useful, and we do have a bit of time. I mean, yeah. I mean that was a, a fantastic, a fantastic presentation, Alex. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, the, the, the areas that I, I know, I mean, we do have some questions. We have questions about uh, Naruto and the monkey selfie, so about ownership, digging in uh, to that a bit more, um, and therefore questions about citation, about what we say about material that's produced, 
via AI. Mm. Um, I've got some sort of broad thoughts about um, how as a copyright advisor, we work through all those issues, remaining in touch with all of our colleagues who are thinking all those broad issues, and how do we make sure that we input our expertise in a way that's helpful? Uh, oh yes. Wait. Absolutely. Um, rather than coming yeah. in and suddenly flooding that conversation with all the layers of complexity that we know exist around ownership of intellectual property and, and the terms and conditions. Um, so generating some kind of coordinated institutional response. Um, I think there's some really interesting stuff about what we see in pushback um, against ideas that traditionally those of us in libraries, cultural and educational institutions have been pushing for for many years. Openness, mm. flexibility in the law, flexibility for text and data mining, mm. and whether we're at a, you know, a crucial moment for sort of working through those and not having a, a sort of a knee-jerk reaction, but also thinking quite carefully. Uh, you're, I loved your metaphor about whether the horse has bolted. Um, there's a number of things there, I think, particularly around the terms of use that we sign up to. We all know that we sign up to terms of use mm. all the time as a matter of, without thinking institutionally, where does that sit? Um, a whole load of things. Can I just, can, I, so can we go back briefly then? I just, a whole load of things that we will return to. <laughs> but the uh, question that was asked is uh, about the monkey self case. Evelyn has asked, did they decide that the copyright would belong to the monkey, uh, but monkeys can't hold copyright? It was quite a complex case, wasn't it? Because there was a, another lawsuit that came in from Peter, the people against the, the ethical treatment of animals, which confused things quite a bit. Um, do you want to give a little bit of uh, background to that? I think it's it's re it's a really interesting analogy to draw on, because th those conversations are going to be really um, relevant for when we talk about the AI activity and how that's generated. And I think that uncertainty is gonna gonna raise again through 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 the coming months and, and hopefully not years but it will be years um and yeah it's it's about you know who created the work is it is it the, the machine itself is it the person that that generates the the prompts that then lead to the output that's generated by the the the, the tool itself or, or or is this is this algorithmic beast gonna generate you know a legal personality and therefore be capable of owning property yeah. it's a really interesting and, and knotty conversation um yeah. that we need to keep an eye on because it, it could be potentially hugely impactful i, I know that didn't answer your question no no but i mean it gets to the heart really of what kind of you know philosophical questions now people are starting to ask themselves you know and we see this from the creative yeah. industries as well don't yeah. we about what it means to be human and what what creativity, true creativity actually is. And, yeah. you know, and, and, and actually, you know, copyright really is at the heart of that. So I, I think it's not that surprising that in quite a number of um, stories that are coming out about AI, copyright is being flagged up as something. Mm. I think yes. there's an element of it where that could be slight scaremongering about, you know, content owners who are concerned about their content being ingested and used in ways that they they don't want but I, I i think there is some genuine concern as well about you know um if i create a work ask an ai to create a work in the style of a living author you know a living author or a living artist yeah. you know i i'm i'm kind of you well know, i guess the question there is what is the difference between asking an AI tool to create a parody or pastiche of something and a human being doing, doing it based on their own experience yeah. of the work? I mean, is that a question you've been asked, Alex? Uh, no, not yet. <laughs> um, but I think it's, uh, yeah, hopefully I won't get asked that question, um, but I'm sure I will. It's, yeah, absolutely. It's that same issue, right? And it's, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's being able to identify what is protectable via copyright and what isn't. You know, yeah. I remember being in conversations with 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 the IPO some time ago, and you know they started bringing in notions of passing off from from trademark and uh, from trademark law and stuff like that, and that's perfectly valid, I think. But it's concerning, right? Like, because copyright law is not trademark law; it's not no. common law in that respect, in the sense that passing off is, and so it's different, and that's potentially 
problematic as well when it comes to to copyright infringement you know we all know the 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 idea expression dichotomy and that fine line sometimes can be problematic you know what is a copyright work versus what is the idea yes yeah, yeah, yeah. And I see Andrew um, has put a comment in, in the chat there, and it's about, it's about ease and money in that scenario, con you'd consider um, as well Always. as the scenario, it's easier to get an AI to do it than another person. So I think we should return to, when we come and have the discussion, we talk a lot about how to avoid claims of copyright infringement by not reusing, say, photographs that you found elsewhere and not have permission for. Mm. Uh, should we, as copyright advisors, be saying, Oh well, just get an AI to do something. It'll come up with something that's completely a different original. photo. It's original, but it's ultimately the same. Mm -hmm. And I think that's it's not an easy question to answer. I don't think I wouldn't feel comfortable by saying, "Hey, just get an AI to do it." Because no. of all these issues you've raised, and similarly, we need to make yeah. people aware, don't we? Uh, I, I think that's right, and I think black box nature of some of these tools right we don't know where they're sourcing the content from we don't know the terms and conditions under which they operate we don't know whether the the harvesting and use of their material is legal in the first place right um so while i you know i understand the thought process that says yes it might be easier it might be quicker to to do that there are those legal ethical questions that 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 are greater than when you go in and, and you source uh, a, an image from a particular website, you cite it properly, you use it with full justification under the exceptions, and that resolves or, or reduces the risk, I think, because it removes the uncertainty. You know who the creator is, you can cite them accordingly. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think so. We'll return, that's kind of returning to the principles of how we've always managed to be a copyright issue and, and, and given advice. Absolutely, I think. which is why I start. Yeah, which is why I start that conversation. This piece, we're saying actually, those literacies, some of those basic skills, we've already got. We use them on a daily basis, and it's just about representing some of that stuff within a particular context, which is bread and butter for this community. Absolutely. Alex, will you be able to join us and we'll pick up some more discussions in the next month's session? Will you be happy? We'll liaise with it okay. over a, a, a suitable Friday early in the month. Yeah, well, I just absolutely. want to go back to that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much for everything you've shared. Um, um, I just want to go back to um, our slides um, because we, we just had a couple, well, we just had one thing um, that we wanted to flag up. Um, I think with uh, a, a resource I've been working on at the moment. If I can get them to stop here. Okay. Oh, I'm, I'm on. I'm Sorry, I'll do it. Yeah, me. That's fine. Right. So I have, I have put the link because you were going to put the link to uh, your and Stephen's video resource. Yeah, so I'm, I'm on a, a, the generative um, AI working group um, that we have at City University, and um, we are putting together a whole series of resources aimed actually primarily at students, although I'm doing a piece of work about staff training about AI as well, and I've run a couple of workshops. I, I think Deborah mentioned huge amounts of the concerns are in her institution as are around plagiarism and academic misconduct, absolutely similar um, in, in, I'm sure, many institutions as well. Um, but Stephen and I were asked to make a video aimed at students about copyright and AI and to sort of touch on some of the wider um, ethical issues. It's not yet available for students, but we've got it on our um, media space platform at, with so that anyone can have a look. I really welcome um, people having a look at it and, um, you know, if you've got any thoughts or feedback, let Stephen and I know. Um, and I say it's a suite of resources that are aimed primarily at students, but we do expect, you know, that, that staff will use it. Hopefully, I'm going to talk to the group about openly licensing some of these resources um, so yeah that's that's just something I wanted to, to mention but we talk exactly about some of those issues around um, you know it, the, the kind of overlaps between copyright and uh, and then when you stray into academic misconduct and whether it does or doesn't help if you get an AI to create images etc we now we're at time we are yeah. future webinars uh we uh have agreed just now that we're going to return in october to this very topic and, yeah. and delve into more detail but we are uh, definitely have a, a, a another guest on a different topic in november david deals talking yeah. to us about open textbooks and david spoke at ice pops and we know it's going to be a fantastic conversation and he did a really great live talk yeah um 
So thank you so much, Alex, for you know for coming along and all, all the work you put in. Yeah, that was a really uh, excellent presentation, and I'm really looking forward to. Yeah, we've the got such good feedback as well. So thank you everybody who joined us today. Um, I think we've just got. One last thing. Our one last thing. We're not okay. going to play the theme music. Yeah. You can explain this. <laughs> uh, it's nothing to do with copyright and AI at all. Uh, this is inspired by um, the recent interest in the Barbie movie. I hosted an exhibition um, in the town where I live in Kent. Um, um, on my look at this. My this is incredible. Uh, Cindy collection, in addition um, to. Many of the things I'm interested in, I love my Cindy's. Uh, it's got it just came down last night, but I just thought I'd share some pictures. So we have some close up, yeah, we have on. a close up of Cindy yeah. in action. So, what's going on here? We have her, <laughs> she's horse. having a little trot around the paddock, with, yeah, with her horse. She's um keeping fit while getting all her chores done in the middle one, hoovering the deck, yeah, in the garden. Yeah, that's my style on Cindy. And uh, she's been out for a picnic on a scooter, don't quite know how she's got the pram and the baby there, but Cindy is a Wonder Woman she can do everything. Um, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. been really popular on social media as well, um, and on local and uh, some Cindy Facebook national groups as well, or international groups. Yeah, there's Cindy in the kitchen, in the bathroom, and she's getting ready to go to the ball in her dress designed by the Emmanuels, who designed Princess Diana's dress. So I was very excited. I still had all those things in my loft. <laughs> so there we go. Something to, you can take away with you. Uh, yeah. For the weekend. If, if anyone wants to see it closer up or want, you know, drop me a line, I'll happily send you. I've got an article I've written about it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks so much for coming, everyone. We yeah. will see you next time.